Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I hope this will be a sacred time for you as we worship together. Today, I continue a sermon series I like to call Conversations with God. It's a series based on uh, a variety of biblical psalms, prayers from the people of ancient Israel to their God. They believed that when God spoke, they should listen, and when they spoke, God would listen. So let us worship together now in spirit and in truth as we pray together to the God of love and compassion and mercy. Good morning. Welcome to Time with Children at Home Edition. This morning we're blessed with not just one critter, Dixie, but my other critter, Bella, the cat, who has her back to us. She gets a little ouchy sometimes. We'll leave her be. I'm Miss Good, and I'm wondering, have you ever made a mistake? Well, I made a big boo-boo. My Time with Children message last week was supposed to be this week's. So this week's message was supposed to be last week. Either way, I hope you enjoy my message this morning. We are still talking about the beauty and the world that exists around us. Now, I'm typically outside, but I'm inside this morning for a specific reason. Um, we talk about God's love surrounding us all the time, 24 seven, almost like a warm, cozy blanket. This is what I want you guys to do. I want you to find a warm, cozy blanket at home because that's gonna be our message today. Mine just happens to be right here. This blanket has very special meaning to me because I gave it to my father several years ago, actually many years ago, it says, love you more. It was a fun little thing that we used to say to each other. Now, 
In the summertime, you might not think you need a blanket, but if you go out and you get sunburned or you are really hot and you come into the air conditioning, sometimes you can be a little chilly, right? So a blanket can put some warmth around you. And that really is significant because of God's love for us. In storms, in storms not just outside in the summer, but storms in our lives when we are we are scared and we are looking for God, yes, Dixie, to help us and to be with us, just knowing that God is with us 24-7 can really bring that warmth around us just like a cozy, cozy blanket. So try it sometime. If you're scared, if you are lonely, if you are feeling uncertain, especially during this time of COVID, when we have not been out and about and seeing those that we love as much as we wish, put a blanket around you and soak up that warmth. Let us say a prayer together. Will you join me? Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. That feels like a warm blanket. That feels like a warm blanket. And that also warms my heart. And that also warms my heart. Amen. The Psalms have been referred to as a school of prayer because they offer words for experiences of hurt and suffering anger and anguish, and also for experiences of joy and thanksgiving. This week we will explore Psalm 30, which is a psalm of thanksgiving, but it is not a simple prayer of thanksgiving. And to understand the layers of the psalm, I want to show what Walter Brueggemann proposes about the psalms, that the psalms can be categorized into themes or the seasons of life the seasons of life that they express. He named the seasons orientation, disorientation, and new orientation. On your screen is a depiction of these seasons. Orientation is a season of well-being, order, and security in life. One trusts in the reliability of God's good creation. My Hebrew Bible professor, Denise Hopkins, offers that the figure on the left represents orientation because it seems to radiate the serenity of security. In her book, Journey Through the Psalms, Denise writes, it is a calm figure with arms folded across the chest, almost as if to shut out the pain of the real world. The hands can either be seen in a posture of prayer or in a defensive position as if to say, everything is fine with me, thank you. Don't come any closer and mess it up. This is the season where one has life and God all figured out. Next is disorientation, and that's the season of disorder, suffering, and estrangement. Psalm laments bringing this pain of shattered order to expression. New orientation is a season in which a surprising new gift from the sovereign God has been received just when one was not expected, and one's disorientation is undone. Last week, we read together a classic psalm of lament. Today's psalmist has moved from the orientation of lament to being transformed into a new perspective. We all are transformed at one time or another. Hopefully, it's for the good, the good of all humanity. So let's listen to a conversation with God that tells the story of transformation from Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul from Sheol and restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Commentators say that this psalmist has been surprised by grace, a grace that has pulled them from the pit and restored their soul and mended their brokenness. We aren't told the specific reason the psalmist was in the pit, 
What we do know is that something inexplicable emerged in their life that presented a new possibility and a new perspective. We call that inexplicable newness grace, the grace of God. And we don't know how this newness happens any more than we know how the blind see or the wounded are healed, except by God's grace. There is a danger in these opening words because many people have interpreted this as a return to a former way of being, like a cure from an illness. But we must be careful not to interpret it with the idea that if one just prays hard enough, God will answer and grant their exact wish. Because if God grants wishes, why do some loved ones die of their diseases and others don't? Why or did their family or did they not pray hard enough? When my mother was dying of cancer, her nurse warned me not to pressure my mother. She was afraid I was going to pressure her into believing that if she prayed hard enough, she would be cured. Why do some relationships splinter irreconcilably? Why do bad things happen to good people, people who pray and are faithful? What exactly happens when we pray? Why pray at all? Why bother to pray other people's prayers? Pastor and Professor Belden Lane offers that when we mumble each other's prayers, they will shine, surely bind us into a more closely knit humanity, helping us to know that we are not alone. They will remind us that the Holy One, beyond all the names we might use for divine presence, that one, that God, is a God of compassion and love. In this prayer, the experience of grace was so transformative that the psalmist shares the news with his faith community and wants them to join in the celebration. Listen again for a word from God. Sing praises to the Lord, O you faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. Then you hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I give thanks to you forever. Here ends the reading of Psalm 30, a prayer for all of God's people. Amen. I have a seminary friend that I met while I was doing my doctoral work in Atlanta. Beth, whose name I've changed, is about my age and we both had three children, roughly the same age. Beth is a campus minister at a Presbyterian college and her husband is a college professor at a new, nearby university. Beth and I took a writing class together and she is one of the most gifted writers I know. A few years ago, Beth posted on her Facebook page, a, pl a place where some life stories are now shared, that her 26 year old son had died unexpectedly. She didn't say how, she didn't need to. She, her husband, and their children were thrown into the pit of loss and grief. And those of us who love them, are her, our hearts broke and hurt for them. Beth was honest and open in her laments. Laments like not taking enough family pictures, to having to do the hard work of death, 
notifying banks, cleaning out her son's apartment, being together as a family of four now instead of five. After two months had passed, and while no one ever gets over the death of a child or the death of a loved one, because it's impossible to return to a prior state of being, Beth's story began to show glimmers of healing and movement to a new orientation. At the time, Beth wrote from a remote cabin in the woods about being lifted from the pit. I spent the first hours of the day at a small desk, looking out the dormer window of the cabin, high in the trees. A branch downed in the last storm wilts on the roof outside. I drink coffee and write thank you notes, formal note cards on beautiful paper. I write them in batches according to their category on the spreadsheet. Flowers, food, memorials, other. On a good day, I can write five, maybe seven if I do another shift at night. They come slowly, each note reminding me of a particular kindness. Tomato soup, a peace lily, spare rooms, a bracelet, music lessons. Now here's where Beth trusted God and ministered to us in her faith. These offerings brought to the grieving are kind of a sacrament, one thing standing in for another. People wanted to bring Mark back and couldn't, so instead they trusted deli meat to carry their love, and it did. Now the act of remembering the gift and saying thank you, which will probably take the rest of my life, brings the presence of these dear people and their kindness back to me far away in the woods. The love that surrounded us those first awful days renews itself and somehow fortifies me for another day of sadness. A few weeks later, Beth wrote her witness to seeing light from the pit. And then joy breaks in. In Chicago with son Doug, making good on our Christmas present to him of tickets to Hamilton this afternoon. In all my sadness, I can't let myself forget the good that remains. Our fantastic kids, the gift of beautiful cities and countryside, of art and music and the love that surrounds us. Recently, Beth wrote, with my boy and now headed to New York City and to see husband and daughter, then home at last, picking up pieces making beauty out of broken things, blessings and loss, living side by side in each moment. Transformation is never easy and healing is not a return to a former state. Healing is our movement to a new orientation, no matter the depth of the loss. In the Psalms, we overhear prayers to God prayers that help us give voice to our own prayers. Again, a quote from my friend Denise that she wrote in her book, Journey Through the Psalms. What is most powerful about the Thanksgiving Psalm is the way in which it lays out the story of personal deliverance as the stuff of communal celebration, a communal celebration for the faithful. Now in this Psalm, Many Bible translations title Psalm 30 with Thanksgiving for recovery from grave illness. Yet the ascription reads a psalm, a song at the dedication of the temple of David. Now the title and the ascription don't seem entirely related. One is personal and one is communal. Regarding the temple ascription, Jewish sources associate Psalm 30 with the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah. It's a celebration when the Temple Mount was taken back by Judas Maccabeus and his troops after the oppression of Antiochus IV Epiphanes in 167 BCE. A communal celebration after a grave affliction was felt by an entire ethnicity due to powerful oppression and exploitation by a ruler and his people of a different ethnicity. 
it's shockingly current. Now it's been said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Personal laments are coming from the loved ones of the names listed here. Loved ones who have lost children, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, and they possess their own laments. Not unlike Beth's, but with the added anguish of knowing their deaths were due to tragic violence because of the color of their skin. Over the past two months, it seems that we have entered into a time of reckoning where glimmers of grace and hope are shining through for communities of color. Just yesterday, NASA announced that Mary W. Jackson, a hidden figure, the first African-American female engineer at NASA, will now have the Washington headquarters named after her. The mayor of the District of Columbia renamed 16th Street Black Lives Matter Plaza across from the White House. People all over the world are protesting the policies of racial injustice that place white lives over black lives and lives of every color. White people are not simply praying now, but stepping into the fray for their sisters and brothers of color. And yet we have such a long, long way to go. But it begins with slowing ourselves down down to get control of our own hearts. Pulitzer Prize winning author Isabel Wilkerson says that the heart is the last frontier. So true. The heart is the last frontier. Maybe this pandemic isolation is connected with the progress that the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement has made. Maybe time has slowed enough for some white folks to see what is really happening. Many of us white citizens earnestly feel that we aren't racist. Yet this battle isn't against, this battle against racism isn't about I, it's about we. Progressives are pretty careful when it comes to overt racism. However, much of the racism that we need to fight is so deeply ingrained in our psyches that we don't realize it's there. And yet it shapes our every thought and decision. History is most often written by the winners, they say. And it's most often true. Yet we have to relearn our history to see how we've been shaped by policies that advantaged one color of skin over all the other colors. This feat requires what early 20th century writer, American writer Sinclair Lewis called a willingness to sift the sanctified lies, a chore that is hard enough when the lie is trivial. Imagine how difficult it is for a community of people to listen to and then accept a truth that overturns everything we formerly believed about our world. How do we accept a truth that informs us that the world is not what you think it is, and by the way, neither are you? It takes great intellectual courage to consider, let alone accept, the truth that demands so much of us. Yet we follow the way of Jesus who said, the truth will set you free, all of us free. And we believe it, don't we? We believe there can't be true cheap, true peace until justice is done. And as one of your new pastors said a couple of weeks ago, we are sent into the world as Jesus to join our sisters and brothers of color in our common humanity, to listen and to learn and to pray their tragically serious laments and to get on our knees and protest, to join them in their efforts to overturn oppressive policies in our country so that they know they are not alone and that we walk with them just as Jesus walked with the least, the last, the lost, and the oppressed. We can then together rejoice and give thanks for each new movement 
toward a new hope-filled orientation. And Jesus, as Jesus, we can't give up. We have so much to learn and so far still to go as we follow the one who went to the cross so that his community of faith could move into a new orientation of hope and mercy and love. Now, I once heard Brian Blount, the African-American president of Union Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, preach. He said, as a Christian, if the road you are on doesn't have a cross on it, you are not on the right road. And I think he's right, because Jesus told potential followers that they would need to take up their cross daily to follow him. May we have that strength, the courage, and the wisdom to be Christ's presence for all of God's beloved. Amen. today, I am going to end with um, an adaptation of the Lord's Prayer from the Casa del Sol community in New Mexico. It's an adaptation of the Lord's Prayer and it uh, touches my soul and I hope it does for you too. Let us now pray together to the God of compassion and mercy and love. Let us pray. We cry to you for help, O Lord, for you alone have the power to restore our lives. Hear us, O Lord, be gracious to us. We offer our words of praise for your love, for your mercy and your healing ways. Now we offer prayers to those waiting to be healed, for those who are suffering from this pandemic, and for those who are ministering to the suffering. For those who feel the injustices of oppression, We pray also that you give bread to those who are hungry and drink to those who thirst. Give life to those who are dying and grace to those who are sick with sin. Give justice to those who are oppressed and peace to those who live in fear. Give comfort to those who mourn and hope to those who despair. 
as you breathe life into dust and make dry bones dance with joy. Give new life to our weary world. We pray in the name of Christ Jesus, ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe. Your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings for the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, your life is a gift of grace. Use it to the glory of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go. Amen. <laughs>